Okay, so I'm Paul Verhaeg, and I just think the way to start a presentation is you should do like um, Igneo Montan Mon Montoya, where you should give a polite greeting, give your name, personal link, and manage the expectations of your presentation. So, welcome to my presentation. I'm Paul Verhaeg, a near space evangelist out of Idaho. And I've been exploring near space since 1996, and I'd like to give you some facts about near space muons, a little bit of history, and how we detect them. Uh, but, you know, before you can actually discover subatomic particles, you have to discover the atom. Now, I'm a chemistry teacher at Treasure Valley Math and Science Center, so that's kind of one of the things I teach at my classroom, and I'll kind of go through uh, some of the stuff with you also. So we can go back to 5th century, uh, the Greek philosophers. Um, some of them argued that if you took a piece of, um, a slice, so, so for instance, take a slice of a breakfast we have outside. You can break it in half. You can break it in half again. You can break it in half again. The question is, can you keep breaking it down in, ad infinitum and never get to the smallest particle? Or could you get to the smallest particle and have one particular particle and nothing smaller than that? The philosophers who believed that was the case called them atomos, A for not, and then atomos for breakable. So we get the word atom from that. And they had the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Later on, Gal uh, um, Aristotle added ether, which was the quintessence or the fifth element that was the element of the, of the heavenly bodies, the stars and planets. So this is kind of where we start out, and it's because of some Greek philosophers that we actually have, like Democritus and his teacher, that we actually have the concept of the atom. Now, there's a problem with this version of the atom, though, is that wood has an atom, a piece of cake has an atom, water has an atom, everything has its smallest atoms. That's not the way we conceive of atoms today, but at least they were on the right track to defining an atom. Uh, so this is, again, uh, Democritus, and this is what he came up with. Uh, so, like, you know, an example, like iron atoms, again, air at atoms of air, for instance. Um, the reason why some Greek philosophers would have argued about this version of the atom is the nature of a vacuum was their, was their idea, and if you had the smallest possible particle, you had to have vacuum between the particles, and they didn't think that was the case. So the argument was, can you continue to break uh, matter into smaller and smaller pieces without stop, or do you get to the smallest part? We're going to go with the discovery of the atom by Democ or the concept of the atom by uh, Democritus, because that's what's going to lead to our modern science. It takes 2,000 years before another chemist, uh, John Dalton, comes up with a better concept of the atom, and now he, he, what he realizes, and this is due to chemistry, that atoms are the smallest particles of elements, but elements get combined in fixed proportions to form molecules. This becomes the, the, the model for the atom that we have today. Uh, this actually made sense at this point here. You could actually discover elements with this and figure out a compound, if it was in, whether it was truly a compound or if, if it was an element. Uh, so we have to thank uh, uh, John Dalton for this, this breakthrough. Again, it took 2,000 years for this to happen. Okay, but now we still have, still have a problem here. We have atoms, but we can't conceive of a subatomic particle yet. So next we end up with J.J. Thompson, a physicist in the 1800s, 19th century, used a cathode ray tube, which is the predecessor to the vacuum tube that we used in televisions and, and your elect old electronics in the 1950s. If you put high voltage on metals, you get a stream of particles coming off. And he understood and figured it out that those stream of particles are actually electrons. Those are actually a particle of the atom. <clears throat> so whereas Dalton was incorrect, was correct about elements having, may, being made up of atoms, um, Dalton expanded that to, or excuse me, Thompson expanded that to say that actually atoms have subatomic particles themselves. And this was the discovery of the electron. Uh, Rutherford was the next person I want to talk about. And in this case here, he took radium inside of a lead container, put a small hole in it, and used that as a, basically a radium gun, shot out alpha particles, subatomic particles. This is the nucleus of the uh, helium atom. Bombarded gold foil with it and found out that like 99.999% of the time, those alpha particles went straight through the gold foil. But a very small percentage of the time, they would actually deflect or even bounce off of the gold foil. Due to the fact that most, you know, over a th one out of a thousand, more than one out of a thousand alpha particles went straight through the atom, he took that to, to be a, create a new model of the atom that had a nucleus in the center that had the positive charge and then electrons on the outside. 
the volume of, of the atom is mostly nothing. It's vacuum. There's nothing in there. The nucleus, if we took a, a stadium, for instance, the nucleus of an atom would be like a BB in the center of the atom, and the electrons would be uh, f like mosquitoes flying around the, the bleachers of the, of the, um, of the stadium. Uh, but he got, the he got the structure of the atom uh, correct. Still, there's one problem, though, is we can't account for all the mass. We have electrons, which are almost nearly massless. They're one two thousandth the mass of a proton. And then we've got these positive charges in the middle, but there's still about half of the mass of the atom that's missing. Well, it became uh, the work of Chadwick, uh, James Chadwick, who actually uh, took alpha particles again and bombarded beryllium atoms. And then the beryllium atoms gave off a particle that he fired into, pro into paraffin. And from that, he discovered the neutron. Now we have the particles of the atom, the protons and neutrons in the center, electrons on the outside, mostly empty space. Now we can start conceiving of subatomic particles. Well, at least we know three of them. Um, the next kind of step I want to go up in here is discovery of cosmic rays. And this is one of the things I find interesting about uh, near spaces. I can study cosmic rays with them. So Victor Hess, about 1912, was riding hydrogen balloons up to about 20,000 feet, carrying electroscopes. Now, electroscope measures a change in charge between two. Uh, so if you think of the, uh, the gold leaf electroscope, so you do it like aluminum foil or gold leaf, hang the two leaves over a piece of metal, charge it up, the, the leaves will, will, will repel each other because they have the same charge. How long it takes for them to collapse again tells you how fast that charge leaves. So Victor Hess was using electroscopes because the geiger muller tube didn't exist back then, so there's no Geiger counters at this time. Going up in these balloon flights and then measuring how long it took for the, his gold, his, uh, in this case it was a uh, fiber that they used, but how long it took the, uh, the fibers to lose charge. And they could measure ionization in the atmosphere. What he discovered is that the higher he went above the surface, the longer it took for the charge to disappear. That told him that there is a source of charge in the atmosphere that gets uh, more intense as you go up in altitude. The source had to be cosmic in origin, so they call, referred to them as cosmic rays. Uh, so discovery of high energy particles, uh, there was an argument at the time if they're photons of energy like electromagnetic radiation, or are they subatomic particles? Uh, or corpuscles, uh, then this was an argument back around the, the 1920s that they were still, the, still arguing, trying to figure out. But this at least is the discovery of cosmic rays. This is the highest energy source of subatomic particles that was known at the time and until about the 19, in fact, even today, there are cosmic rays that are more powerful than the uh, particles that they create at the LCH or the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. Uh, in fact, the most powerful cosmic ray for a single subatomic particle had the energy of a softball or a baseball thrown at 100 miles an hour. Uh, but those are r relatively rare. But up into the 1950s, before the cyclotron, this was the highest source of subatomic particles that people could uh, get access to to do experiments. But they discovered cosmic rays here. Um, the next person I want to talk about is, I, I, I'm going to miss it, Mr. Yukawa. I'm going to forget, I forgot how to pronounce his first name. It's not Hideki, Hideki, uh, Hideki, Yukawa. And he said, you know what, the protons in the nucleus are positively charged. They're going to repel one another. What holds these particles together inside the nucleus? And he hypothesized a new subatomic particle. This is what leads to the muon. So this is going to be a, a particle that mediates what's called the strong force that holds these holds these uh, protons together so they don't repel each other, but it only works with inside the nucleus. That meant it had to have a mass, uh, a fair, fairly massive, but not as massive as a proton or neutron. So they referred to it as a middle mass particle or a meson. Uh, and this would be a, the first subatomic particle that was actually predicted that wasn't the protons or neutrons, but actually was something in between the mass of an electron and the proton and neutron. So he was predicting the, the meson. Uh, Anderson and Seth Meyer, uh, Carl Anderson and Seth Meyer, um, were the ones who actually discovered the, the meson. They called it a mesotron for middle, uh, middle, middle mass particle. But what they discovered was the mu meson, which is what I want to focus on, not the pi meson. The pi meson is Yukaya's particle. The pi meson is what actually holds those protons together. So now we're down to the, discover the mu meson, which is later on named the muon because it's not truly a meson. So this gets us to where we have a zoo of subatomic particles 
one of those particles, the muon, is the one that I'm interested in and I'd like to talk a little bit about. So one way to classify subatomic particles is either force carriers, your leptons, or your hadrons. Force carriers have no internal structure. Uh, the example of that would be the photon, the radio wave, the light that you see. Those are bundles of electromagnetic magnetic radiation. There's no structure to them. There's no smaller particle. And these can be classified as a, as a, a photon, which is electromagnetic radiation. There's bosons, gluons. Uh, the bosons are what are responsible for radioactive decay. Uh, gluons are responsible for holding part of the quarks together inside of the proton and the neutron and the graviton, which has not been discovered yet. Lighter mass particles, the leptons, also have no internal structure. They can detect electromagnetic radiation and also detect the weak force. And these consist of three electrons, three different types of electrons, and three different types of neutrinos. This, this electron, this is where the muon fits in that, we, that, are, that, uh, that you can actually measure. And actually, I'll show you one way, one way you can measure that. Then there's the hadrons. These are the high mass particles, protons, neutrons. And these are made up of either three quarks, where it becomes a baryon, or it is a meson consisting of two quarks. If it's three quarks, you have the three primary colors. So it's the color force that holds them together. Or if it's the meson, it's a color and it's anti-color. All hadrons are white in color because they have either a color, anti-color, or three primary colors mixed together. And that's how they figure, they call it the color force, uh, which is the, the, uh, the gluons that actually hold these things together. So the muons that we discover are originating in cosmic rays. Muons are never the product of radioactive decay. They're too high energy for that to be the case. But the uh, cosmic ray will originally enter the atmosphere. I think we got a laser pointer. Will enter the atmosphere, collide with a molecule in the air, primarily nitrogen, sometimes oxygen, and create a shower of secondary particles. If you launch a Geiger counter on an airspace flight, you'll detect these secondary particles, and it will increase in numbers. You get up to altitude till about 62,000 feet, then the number decreases. The production of these secondaries drops off above 62,000 feet. We call that the FLOTS line, and I'm going to pass around an article. This actually was discovered by a, a gentleman by the name of Eric uh, Regner. His student was FLOTS. We name it after his student, but not after Eric Regner, who's actually the first one to kind of discover this. So I'll pass around this article from History of Geo and Space Sciences. I'll pass this around. I can email a copy of this out also. But this makes the argument we really should be calling it the Regner Flots line rather than the Flots line. So I'll go and start passing this around. You can take a look at this. Though it, the ones that I'm interested in are not the gamma rays and the electrons that are created, but I'm interested in these pi mesons. This is Ukiah's particle, but that's not what was detected. What they detected was these muons down here, so our negatively charged muon here. This is what was, what was actually discovered um, in cosmic ray studies when they discovered the first meson. And these are the ones that I'm most interested in. This is what we detect with the Geiger counter. So the muons. Uh, the muons are a lepton, which means they're, they're, um, they're not the heaviest mass and they have no internal structure, so no quarks inside of them. They're produced by high energy impacts, cosmic rays primarily. The Large Hadron Collider will create them also, but radioactive decay does not create muons. Uh, they behave like an electron. They're about 207 times heavier than an electron, and they have a charge of either a plus one or minus one. A negative one if it's a muon, plus one if you're an anti-muon. The spin is a, minus, is a one half, which makes it a fermion, which means you can't stack them infinitely together. They have to have different energy levels to be stacked together. Uh, they pair with its own muon, so those three electrons I talked about was the electron, the muon, and the tau particle. They each have their own muon that they, or their own uh, neutrino that they associate with. So a muon will decay and will give off a muon neutrino. They live for only two and a half uh, milliseconds, or excuse me, microseconds. That's their half-life. 2.2 microseconds, half of them will decay. But when these are created high in the atmosphere, it takes longer than 2.2 microseconds for them to get to the surface. But because they are traveling at about 98% the speed of light, their lifetime is expanded due to time dilation to about 11 microsecond half-life, and they can actually reach the surface. So you can detect them here on the ground. In fact, they represent about half of the ionizing radiation that we have here on the surface. So if, if someone doesn't believe in relativity, this is an example that shows you that relativity truly exists. 
They're very deeply penetrating. Uh, they can be detected in mines. Um, and the, the amount of radiation you get is about one square centimeter per second at sea level. So if you hold out your hand, you've got hundreds of them going through your hand in, in every second. That's how, how often they go, how uh, dense the radiation is from muons. And they represent about half of the radiation that we're being exposed to right now. Detecting them, the way I first detected them was a cosmic watch and this is a detector made by MIT. Uh, they sell them for $150. I've sent this up on a balloon flight. I've sent two of them up, in fact, in coincidence mode, where I stack two of these on top of each other, run a cable between them, hook them up to a battery pack, which unfortunately died on me just a few minutes ago, uh, but packed that inside of a, of a lunchbox. <laughs> where, is that, where did that, where did those come out? So MIT, I think I have a link here in just a moment. But yeah, if you do a search for Cosmic Watch MIT, Cosmic Watch MIT, uh, you can, you, there's a link there, and I think I have a link I'll, I'll bring up in just a moment. But yeah, Cosmic Watch MIT has them. Um, $150 a piece, like I said. But I stacked one on top of the other, and what's really nice about that is they're in coincidence mode, so only when a cosmic ray passes through both of them at the same time, or within a very short period of each other, do you actually detect it. So now I know cosmic rays coming straight through the detector rather than radiation coming from all different directions. So they work really well with, uh, in coincidence mode. It's all automatic. It runs off an Arduino. And I'll get into a little more detail about how this works in just a moment. But this is a really simple way to detect them. It's a solid state detector, a little bit different than a Geiger counter. The way this works, oh, so here it is, cosmicwatch.ins.mit.edu. Uh, so the link at the bottom here is, the, uh, is where, you, where you go to uses a scintillator material. This is a plastic with a dye, and when ionizing radiation passes through the dye, it actually gives off a spark of light. There's a solid state photomultiplier, and this is a silicon device, SIPM is what they call it, silicon photomultiplier, that actually amplifies the spark of light and gives you a voltage. And that voltage can then be uh, analyzed with an Arduino. This all runs off an Arduino. Data is saved on an SD card. Um, so you can see, there is a, the scintillator material here covered in black electrician's tape because if this is exposed to light, it would just be screaming signals constantly. And then it flashes an LED every time it detects. Got an OLED screen on the front here to tell you what the counts are, but you can also hook it up to a PC and you can download the data from it. Uh, you don't have to necessarily just read this, but I would send this up and then bring it back down. I pulled the SD card out, but now I, with a better laptop, I can actually read the data off the SD card and then can get the data and it shows, it's, it's a ton of data, it's megabytes of data that you collect from this. The way the data is, out, is uh, formatted, it gives you how much time between each one of the detections you make. And just remember, there's gonna be hundreds of these things coming through here every second. So there, there's a lot of data that comes out of this and I'll show you what that data looks like. Another way is with the cloud chamber and that's what I'd like to demonstrate, to set up for right now. So. Um, Third time's the charm. Uh, this is the third time I tried to design a, a cloud chamber, finally worked. So a piece of foam, a lid, and I got one from a cookie, uh, from a, uh, a box of cookies, painted it black inside, clear plastic cup, and I put a piece of felt inside, but a sponge might be better. Dry ice, and your gloves, unless you wanna get frostbite. I'll set this up and we'll just leave it set out here for, and it'll probably run for 30 minutes or so before it needs to be recharged again. Okay, so then I wanna put the flat surface, it uh, looks like that's there. Put the lid on. Let's go. Okay, then, what I need is to create an atmosphere inside of here that is super saturated, but not to the point where I get condensation yet. So I'm gonna use 91% rubbing alcohol. Uh, do not drink this if you're an adult. And if you're not an adult, don't drink it either. You wanna saturate the, the, uh, the felt or the, um, the, like I said, sponge might be work better because it would hold more rubbing alcohol. 91%, you need to get this really high proof rubbing alcohol. Um, you want to get, because uh, if it's not, you have water, and water doesn't actually condense out and, uh, as, as well. 
Okay, so I got a little excess in there. We have a trash can I can just flick this into. Oh, okay. Okay, so now that's all there is to it. Now we'll go ahead and place this on top. Uh, I didn't touch the dry ice. Okay, so now what's going to happen is this plate on the bottom is going to get really cold. We've got a heat source on the top. That's room, that's room temperature. You need to put your hand on here to drive the heat. What I want to do is keep the top warm. That will vaporize the alcohol. The alcohol then, the vapor then swirls around inside this container here. And it's going to be fairly saturated. But when it gets near the bottom of this lid here, because this lid is touching dry ice at about minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's going to start getting super saturated. And at that point, and also, by the way, I have a, there's a lip around here. I don't want any air currents passing through here. I want this to be a very still environment where the vapors actually get to descend and then they get close to the bottom. They're looking for a, nucle a condensation nuclei to form a cloud. That condensation nuclei will be a charged particle, muon in this case here. So we turn on a light. I can put it to the side here, shine light through here. And over time, as this becomes super saturated, you'll actually will see lines of a cl basically clouds that basically form across it to the zip of a cloud, and the cloud then settles to the bottom. A moment later, there's another zip, and you get another cloud that forms as a straight line that settles to the bottom again. I've got a link here, which you can show on YouTube real quick. I'll see if I can show that here real quick. But that's all it takes to make a cloud chamber. And now you just put the light out here and just wait for it to get cold enough for the uh, vapor to condense out. And right now it's still, still a little too warm, uh, but I would let this, we'll just let this sit here and just continue to cool and get that cloud of uh, vapor to form in here and then look for the condensation to form out. So we'll kind of let that keep going. But that's, a, that's as easy as it is to make a cloud chamber, really simple. Really easy way to detect cosmic rays. It works well on the ground. I need to figure a way to do that into near space. So I'm thinking about a peanut butter jar lid, a peanut butter jar, Teflon tape, use a piece of, uh, of sponge, saturated well, put a hand warmer on top, styrofoam block, then the light, and then a video camera, a little camera to record it. And my goal is, I hope, uh, later on this maybe fall, to do a balloon launch with the cloud chamber, because I don't know that anyone's actually done that yet. And we'll go to this video here in just a moment. Okay. The way this, when you look inside of it, what you'll get is it'll be a cloud. It'll be a straight line. It's a cloud, and it's actual uh, part of, uh, or vapor. It's uh, the vapor of, um, of the alcohol waiting to condense to form a cloud. So it's a tiny cloud that gets formed from the subatomic particle, the charged particle passing through the um, supersaturated ammonia vapors inside of, that, inside of that cloud chamber. And that's what you get, these little straight lines here. Okay, so this is how you can detect muons in near space. If you'll get a cosmic watch, this is supposed to only detect muons. It doesn't detect any other subatomic particles because it's in a metal frame. Uh, particles like alphas and betas can't get through here. Uh, but muons are very penetrating, so they will get straight through here. And then if you line two of them on top of each other, you'll make sure you detect only those coming down from, straight down from near space. But they're using muons for other things too. One thing is that they penetrate more deeply than x-rays. So you can do what's called tomography and actually look at objects inside of containers using uh, muons. So one of them, here, they use an example. This is a muon detector. These are flat plates, the sim similar to what we have here, scintillator material with photomultiplier tubes. But these are put inside of the pyramids. And they lay these across the pyramids, and they move them around. And they count the number of muons going through. Where you get a lot of muons, you get uh, bright spots. Where you get very few muons, you get cooler or bluer, bluer locations. The corners of the pyramid have the most material, so muons don't penetrate very deeply through the corners. Uh, you've got these chambers inside of here, but you've also noticed you've got this extra space right in here that stands out that led, leads some people who are doing what's called scan pyramid to believe that there is a void or there's a space inside the pyramid that hasn't been discovered yet. There's an open room in there. And that's by just measuring how well cosmic rays penetrate the pyramid, and they get through this room, this open space, more easily than they do through the rest of the pyramid. And then you can see the pyramid is, is this square pyramid shape because the corners also have extra material 
because you're going through the, the corners of the pyramid and you'd get fewer muons passing through there. So this is a way to analyze the pyramid to look for rooms or spaces inside of the pyramid without actually taking the thing apart. On um, this example here, not all muons come straight down, but some of them come off at angles. So I don't remember what volcano this is, but this is a muon detector. The plates are aimed at a, at a volcano and they're letting muons come in at a low angle, pass through the, through the volcano. And this is the muon plot that you get that shows where you get the most or the fewest muons, excuse me, you get the most muons, the fewest muons. And then you see that this volcano has an empty chamber inside. By doing something like this, if you just keep monitoring this, and if you see that this empty space decreases as magma moves up, you can get some idea that there's magma movement inside of a volcano, potentially warning people of a volcanic eruption. Uh, national security, this becomes an issue also. High Z materials are those with high numbers of protons, so it's a high atomic number like uranium, plutonium, things like that. If this is a cargo container and someone tried to ship an atomic bomb inside of it without you knowing about it, you put scintillator material top and bottom, let muons pass through it, and where you have high Z materials, high mass particle, high pass mass atoms like plutonium and uranium would actually absorb those muons and you could say, hey, there's a spot in here. It's about, you know, eight inches across, it's spherical, and it's high, you know, high, high Z material like maybe uranium. You could know, let's pull this cargo container out and let's go and actually open up and inspect it. <laughs> yeah, no, so yeah, so no, it takes time. Yeah, and that's the, I didn't see the time, but I know this is not two seconds. This takes a little more time. Okay, so it yeah. needs to park, it needs to park, place, be examined. That's right, yeah. So yeah, yeah, that, I know, and I, but how long that is, I'm not sure. But yeah, but it's, it's not gonna be very quick. That's right, it won't be that quick. Yeah, we don't have enough muon radiation to make it really quick. Um, also, they can detect really low Z particles like hydrogen. Um, so should there be hydrogen, a lot of hydrogen in here or not? I mean, so you can detect bombs, for instance, uh, using, using this, uh, this method of detection. Okay, so here's the data that I've gotten from my muon flight. Um, so cosmic rays using the RM60 Geiger counter, and I can see the flots line occurring right up here, right around, uh, some, some right around 70,000 feet. This is my cosmic ray data. This is the data from the, uh, the cosmic watch. My cosmic ray data, I count every 10 seconds and I get how many cosmic rays in 10 seconds. And I can get up to about 800 counts per minute at high altitude here. The, uh, the, the detector I'm using here, the, the, spa the, the, um, the cosmic watch here, just tells me how long it is between particles. So I have to do a little math uh, manipulation, a little massaging the data to get a count rate. And the amount of muons you get is very variable. So I don't get a nice little line of particles. I get huge variations in the amount of cosmic rays that are detected. But you'll notice that the muons peak at around 55,000 feet whereas my cosmic rays peak around 70,000 feet. So this is telling me that co the production of cosmic rays, of secondary particles, peaking around 70,000 feet. Muons uh, get, uh, the greatest number of muons actually get produced at a slightly lower altitude, uh, around about 15,000 feet lower. I need to fly this again, which is why I want to do uh, this uh, fall and see if, if, if this happens again here. Uh, but it's interesting to see how the muon production is not doesn't peak at the same altitude as secondary cosmic rays. And part of that makes sense because this is producing pi mesons. Pi mesons then lead to muons, and that might be why I get this difference in the altitude. So I could be detecting something about the production of subatomic particles using detectors like this. So kind of cool to see something like this. But again, I need to repeat this a second time to see if this happens again. And then this might be something worth uh, publishing, but I need to make it more official when I do the, the data and, and I'll talk to someone at a, a university, maybe Boise State University, about helping out with this to make it a, a better publication. But kind of cool to see something like this where the production rates are at different altitudes. Okay, and then I was gonna real quickly show that video. And I think I can just do a copy paste on this. Maybe not. Oh, maybe not. Okay, I, mean, I was going to see if I would just copy and paste this link, but it's not letting me do that. Okay, so anyhow, um, what the video would have shown is kind of what I showed here, how you actually produce a cloud chamber, but also what the, what the cosmic rays look like inside of it. 
And just remember about half of the radiation going through you is, are these muons here. And by the way, uh, we don't use the term mu meson for them. Mesons, remember, are two quarks together. The muon does not have a structure, so it's properly called the muon, not the mu meson like they did in the 1950s. Uh, other than that, I can entertain some questions, and we'll see if this uh, cloud chamber is actually producing some, some clouds or some. Let me see if I. I may need to put a little more alcohol in here. I'm not seeing any clouds yet. I should start seeing the clouds start to form um, from the vapor falling, just this coming off of this uh, lid. And I'll put a little more alcohol in there. I'll just keep this running and come take a look anytime you want. So other than that, that's what I had on muons. You can detect them and they're really useful for national security and doing, doing some science. And but depending on how my flight goes again with my muon detector, there might be an actual difference in the altitude between peak cosmic rays and peak muons, and I'll have to learn more about that and see what that all means. But other than that, um, if there's any questions. Uh -huh. Muons come as positive charge and negative charge. That's right. If they're negatively charged, it's a, it is the muon. If it's positively charged, it's the anti-muon. It's anti-particle. Right. You're detecting both. That's right. I detect. Yeah. Anything that's charged is good. It, oh. Oh. So. So the question was, uh, when we detect muons in the cosmic watch, well, are we looking at positive or negatively charged? And it doesn't discriminate. So this detects any charged particle. So it's the it is a combination of proton of muons and anti muons. Can you think of a way in which you could make the so one reason I want to send up a cloud chamber is I can put a magnet, put a super superconductor, or a superconductor, put a super magnet, a neodymium super magnet at the bottom of your of your cap on the um, cloud chamber, and whether it's a positively or, char or negatively charged particle, it will twist around in opposite directions from each other. And I don't remember which is which. One will give you a positive spin, one will give you a negative spin, and that'll tell you whether it's it's, it's particle or it's antiparticle. So I haven't looked at that yet. So now the particle, so the question is the, the weight of, of doing this experiment. So this part of this um, cloud chamber here is only a few ounces. I would put in, you know, a half a pound of dry ice or something like that. Typically you can do a, a six pound payload and not have to ask for uh, permission or you know, a wave or anything like that to fly. So if you can put together a peanut butter jar lid, sponge, your alcohol, hand warmer, and maybe a pound of dry ice underneath it. And then neodymium magnets are very, very strong. So for their mass, they're very strong. And get, I don't know if you can get neodymium magnets, some that are stronger than others or not, but just get the strongest neodymium magnets you can. In fact, I would get one that would not be just a small disc at the bottom of the, of the metal plate, but I would get one that's as wide as the bottom of the plate. And then just make sure the poles are oriented straight up and down. That would give you a strong magnetic field. You've got to use a video camera, and then the bending may not be really severe, but uh, depending on the strength of the magnet, you will see that curvature, whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise. And that would lead you to um, detecting whether it's the muon or the anti-muon. So yeah, detecting whether it's matter or antimatter, easily done with, it, with a um, cloud chamber, the question is how practical, I don't know yet. Uh, the magnets are gonna be the way to tell though. The cloud chamber with the magnet will be the way to tell. But yeah, these, uh, the, this cosmic watch does not distinguish between matter and antimatter. It, all the particles go straight through. All it detects is charged particles. Is there any feasible way to do this for neutrinos? No. No, no, yeah. If it's neutrinos, no, no. Uh, the problem with, to, so is it feasible to do this for neutrinos? The problem with neutrinos is that they're neutral and they only interact with the weak force, which means you need a huge mass of material and you're not going to fly that on a weather balloon. So, yeah, that's uh, not only that, but if the, I mean, we're talking like, you know, hundreds of pounds of, de of detecting fluid or something like that. Xenon, there's a xenon detector based in a mountain. The problem also is that um, they have to bury these new neutrino detectors deep under the ice or under mountains to try to block all cosmic rays, including as many muons as you can. 
So you go to the bottom of these really deep gold mines, and that's what you need to do to finally block out those muons, and you still get some muons there. Uh, but then trying to detect, detect neutrinos, um, even really powerful neutrino events like supernova explosions and all that, by the time they reach the Earth, you're only talking like a handful of neutrinos at a time. So they're very difficult to, so neutrinos, no, no, yeah, that won't detect, yeah, you can't detect those. In fact, the first neutrinos were detected by their absence. When something like a muon decays, you can look at the electron that comes out and it doesn't have the energy of the muon. So where did that energy go to? It went to, the, to uh, one or more neutrinos, and that's how you discovered them, as you, as there's nothing there, but you know that your energy and mass has to be conserved. So, yeah, no, not the neutrinos, forget it. <laughs> Star Trek technology is what it's going to, t it's going to take. So. Uh -huh. I'm sure you must have found this. I was looking at your graph, like mm -hmm. Geiger counter versus your neutron detector. Yes. And uh, what strikes me about that graph is less that the peaks occurred in different places, but that uh, it almost appears you have a trough where you have the peak. Um, so it means the, mean, these, these troughs, the like, there, right in here. Trough, yes, right. Yes. I'm sure you must have. So the problem, yes, yeah, so the problem is, so the, the question is, what about this trough up here? I mean, look at the cosmic rays. We get, a, you know, we get some variation, but it's a really nice smooth curve here. Muons, we've got these troughs, especially right in here. Part of the problem is that radiation, this, these radiation is, is a random event. And I would really have to fly. Exactly. I need to fly multiple times to see how. And it probably, you know, a future flight, this would be filled out and a trough would be elsewhere. Or there might be two troughs. So, yeah, it's due to, probably due to the random nature. Okay. 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 Thank you.